Hi, we're here today with Tom Whitehead, a name you may recognize, talking about the classics in psychology that may have been sort of forgotten or misunderstood in recent days when cognitive behavior therapy and other similar therapies have taken the forefront. Tom, do you think that there are some key concepts from, say, Freud and Jung that still have value today? Absolutely, and one of the key concepts comes from Carl Jung, who, as you know, is a famous Swiss psychiatrist who actually had some foundational ideas that uh, people at the time didn't understand, and we still don't understand very well today, but have tremendous value for psychology you know, it's really the reason that I wanted to interview you today because it wasn't until you explained some of Jung's concepts that I really had any interest in them. They just seemed, frankly, like uh, some kind of esoteric woo-woo ideas that, that couldn't possibly uh, stand up to scientific rigor. Well, I don't think you're alone in that. Uh, most people today see Jung's ideas as something pretty esoteric and uh, out there. But actually, as he himself emphasized, his ideas are entirely empirically based and they're intended to be practical. And as a matter of fact, he was very well aware that his ideas of the archetype were the bridge between psychology and biology, psychology's mother science. And interesting that you bring up that concept that, uh, you know, to wax philosophic for a while, you know, Freud talked about uh, uh, the psyche in terms of what has been termed psychohydraulics. Uh, really, it just because hydraulics were a brand new science when Freud was around, and he literally believed the possibility that nerves were pipes where hydraulic fluid was pushed around in the brain and in the peripheral nervous system. Later, again, uh, recently, we tend to think in terms of this almost uh, computer model that, uh, you know, the brain must be very much like a computer since we can kind of simulate human thought with a computer. And yet, you know, that's kind of hogwash too uh, because computers are very different from brains. Absolutely. And so, d explain this idea of archetypes, which is one of the ones that seemed woo to me when I heard about it. Okay, well, uh, you know, Jung was uh, very well aware of evolution, and he was very well aware of uh, the connection between psychology and uh, biology. And uh, the idea of an archetype is really strongly related to the idea of an instinct, and he said this many times. So, for example, when you see a cat, and most of us are familiar with cats, and in the cat box they'll uh, do their thing, and then they'll try to cover it up. And if there's nothing there available to cover it up, they end up scratching on the floor and acting as if they were covering it up. So there's an archetype or an instinctual pattern in the cat that is invoked every time at this point after they finish doing their thing in the cat box. It's uh, applied whether it fits or not and all the archetypes are that way. They're inborn patterns of behavior and perception and uh, thinking that are applied and are available for us to apply over and over again in different ways under different circumstances. I remember you explained to me once that uh, something that brought it home for me that we can have a field mouse who's born into kind of desert or arid circumstances and another field mice, a mouse that's born into say a jungle setting mm -hmm. and that they have two different patterns of behavior memorized, as it were, or, or archetypes that they can apply. They can pull out of their bag of tricks, as it were, to suit that uh, particular environment. And for human beings, he, he talks in terms of uh, archetypes like the magician or uh, others, and explain how that correlates. Well, animals, all animals, have uh, their characteristic ways of making their living in the world. And uh, lower animals are kind of like robots in a way. 
But higher animals have things that we call drives, which are archetype based. So they're templates that are available and they're, they're, people are not aware of uh, those templates until they are actually applied. But when they are applied, they result in specific behaviors and experiences, which can be modified as the circumstances demand. For an example from human beings would be the idea of a friend or an enemy. Those things have been useful for our ancestors in terms of their survival. So they're templates that we can apply. But we have different friends and different enemies, and we can uh, apply those those archetypes differently under different circumstances to have individual unique experiences in the moment. And you know, this concept of archetypes stands in sharp contrast to the idea of the tabula rasa, that we are born with absolutely a blank slate willing to be filled in, but needing to be filled in by experience and absolutely nothing coming to us from inheritance. Yeah. A pretty stupid idea when you it's look a, at it. That's a fairly stupid idea. <laughs> but uh, one that was very popular, I th and I think kind of resonated with the American culture, that anybody can become anything. Yeah, and it's still popular even now. We, But the fact is that learning would not be possible. You know, the, the behaviorist learning model was stimulus and response. So we have a stimulus, and then the animal responds in some ways. but. What they wanted to leave out of the picture was individual experience. You have to have an archetype to, to be able to perceive a stimulus, and you have to have an archetype that uh, structures your response to the stimulus. So what they left out of the picture was uh, actually all of experience because that was the bias of the time. But the idea that you could have somehow uh, an abstract stimulus and an abstract response is really unrealistic. And you know, it, it probably harkens to our reliance on this computer model that we think, well, gee, we can't, we can't find a place where this ROM or this hard drive or this operating system is stored in the brain, so it couldn't possibly be inherited. You know, it's got to be just some goo up there that we <laughs> shape into a, into a brain over time. Did Jung ever talk about this method of how archetypes are established over time? Or well, it's just heredity in Jung's view, and that's what most people miss. This is a, an evolutionary concept. So just as we inherit a body structure, you know, different animals inherit a different structure based on how they made their living historically, how their ancestors made their, their living. And human beings are uh, no different. We have a certain body structure. We make our living differently, though, and our ancestors made our living differently. So each animal, uh, for instance, if you compare a chicken to a mouse, uh, the body structures they inherit are quite different, and the archetypes, they're, they're, uh, the ways that they are set up to experience things are very different, too. Uh, Human beings are much more complex than either chickens or mice. So we have a very rich set of archetypes that, we're, that we inherit. Uh, all human beings inherit, according to Jung, the same set of archetypes. And uh, we implement them, them in different ways, depending on our individual lives and our needs in the moment. Uh, interesting, because it you know, it's relatively recent in terms of evolutionary history. When we think about, you know, we've probably got, as far as we know, three or four thousand years of, of uh, history as, as a species of living in a complex society. Mm -hmm. And yet, some of these archetypes seem very much tied to uh, kind of societal roles, not not again, you know, gee, if I'm a mouse in the desert versus a mouse in the jungle, you know, where am I going to look for food? Which could, you know, that could evolve over millions of years. But this must have evolved over just thousands of years. Well, some basic things uh, have evolved recently, but actually the history goes back much further than that. You know, if you own a dog, for example, that you can play with your dog. 
and the dog is quite aware of when you're playing and when things are serious. There's a difference between those two things. Both of those are archetype based. So we get along pretty well with dogs because they realize lots of things are not serious, but some other things are, and they structure their behavior differently according to which archetype they apply. His, his <laughs> education, uh, I think it was at the University of Basel in Switzerland, uh, he was very scientifically educated. He knew all about evolution and uh, had an extensive knowledge of biology. So he wasn't just making this up. Uh, it wasn't coming out of nothing. And central to this idea is that uh, evolution and its form is central to the development of archetypes. That this is not uh, based on Freud's idea of everything being around yeah. psychosexual eroticism at various levels. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is based on evolution, a much more solid concept. Absolutely. And uh, Jung emphasized over and over again that the archetype is the true connection between psychology and biology. And he said he knew that was true because he was aware that responses don't come out of nothing. Would they come out of some equipment that we're born with that we apply differently in different situations. A perfect example of that uh, would be we're, as human beings, equipped to recognize faces where other animals don't recognize faces. They recognize each other in different ways. But we can, we can see faces and there are sources of fascination even from birth for babies. Babies stare for hours at faces. And they can tell when something isn't right in the face that they're looking at. So we're born with that archetypal uh, uh, ability to recognize faces and we, in our lifetimes, we encounter thousands of different faces and they're all different to us, but they're all based on the same archetype. And uh, that's the way they work. You know, lower animals act like robots. Their behavior is sort of rigidly pre-programmed, but higher animals, including people and rats, uh, are able to have, they, they are born with more flexible uh, versions of archetypes, which psychologists sometimes call drives. Um, there's a, a basic uh, archetype embedded in a drive, and also a basic, basic motivation, usually some, tied to some kind of specific need, like for food or sex. But we end up uh, applying that drive in different ways uh, and under different circumstances. And that accounts for a lot of our flexibility as human beings. And flexibility is the key here when you think about... Flexibility it, is the key. If you think about a very simple uh, sponge, let's say, mm -hmm. in the ocean that uh, you know, really doesn't adapt at all. It needs very specific environments. You know, the ocean's got to be a particular pH and it's got to be a particular depth and it's got to have mm -hmm. particular amounts of sunshine, otherwise it cannot survive. Right. And yet, this, as I understand it, this development of archetypes created this tremendous flexibility where we're able to survive and thrive in a range of different environments right. instead of just one specific one. That's exactly right. And, and Jung was quite aware that archetypes were instincts, but they were the um, psychological, the internal psychological portion of instincts so that uh, they could be with lower animals, their instincts are very rigid, but with higher animals, instincts are flexible and um, they can be applied in a vastly greater number of situations. So that's, that accounts for a lot of our flexibility as human beings. And so this ability to inherit behavioral patterns, these archetypes, um, this becomes the, the, the tremendous leap forward in terms of evolution. Because Absolutely. instead of waiting for a bunch of sponges to be killed <laughs> over and over again over perhaps millennia, our adaptation becomes much more rapid if we if we have this system available Absolutely. to us. Absolutely, and one way of thinking about this is that uh, with lower animals, with primitive animals like 
jellyfish and sponges and bacteria. Everything, all the behavior has to be shaped by evolution of individual animals over generation. Uh, so a population can change its behavior. But the advantage of a drive or an archetype that can be applied flexibly is that the evolution takes place internally within one individual. So there's an adaptation of, a, of an inborn archetype. It evolves internally into something that's useful for that individual during that individual's lifetime. It's a tremendously speeded up application of evolution. And in that way, the computer model of artificial intelligence does kind of apply more, that people realize that, gee, if you just have this one device, you know, light switch turns a light on and off, yeah. there's no other way to reprogram it. But with the artificial intelligence of essentially giving it a whole bunch of experience and saying, okay, you figure out when the light should be on or off. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is a kind of more adequate metaphor for this. It is. And it's also true that in every uh, generation, in every time in history, we use the best concepts available to make sense out of things. And in Freud's day, maybe hydraulics was the best he had to work with. But we have a computer and computer sciences and uh, computer programming and technology to apply. That doesn't mean it's correct. That just means we have more tools available for understanding things than we used to. Right. It's a, it, we need a conceptual model because it is. It's so fantastically complicated we can't really comprehend right. it at its source. It's impossible. So, so we have to have a kind of metaphor for it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about Jung is, and clearly it's your opinion and mine <laughs> that he had a lot more valid uh, information to spread on for generations than did Freud. Is there anything that Freud did or said that sure, and, could uh, be valuable today? As we have discussed before a couple of times, uh, Freud did offer the idea of uh, unconscious uh, motivation and unconscious activity, which is uh, most of what we do and most of what we think is actually unconscious and our conscious bandwidth is very limited. So I think that was a valuable idea and he did have a lot to do with promoting that idea. It is. It, it's astonishing to think because it's so much woven into modern thinking that we're not aware of all of our motives uh, that we we forget that that was a completely new idea yeah. when Freud uh, came on the scene. And another idea which uh, he brought to the scene is this idea that children are different than adults. Right. <laughs> that there is a development process. Right. We can make some fun out of how he chose to do that, this 30-year-old virgin. <laughs> Guess what he's thinking about all the time. Uh, but, uh, but this idea of development and developmental psychology is also brand new mm -hmm. with him. And that is a contribution. So. We shouldn't make light of it, even though some of the other ideas that Freud put forth, I, I think, are at this point shop worn and people don't take them seriously, and maybe they shouldn't take them seriously. Some of them, as a matter of fact, are destructive. The idea, for example, that every woman who has a recollection of being sexually abused in childhood is somehow just responding to a fantasy that uh, suppressed awareness of sexual abuse for decades. And I'm glad that's no longer the case. And it's actually his daughter who came up with the list of defenses, but we can make a case that this is Freud using one of those, which is denial, that he, he could not <laughs> stand the idea that sexual abuse of children was as, um, common as we now believe it to be and yeah. he had to come up with this whole theory to repress that idea. Yeah. Interestingly, according to the research I've done, before Freud came on the scene there was an awareness that children were commonly sexually abused and when his theories became popular that awareness kind of went away. Uh, briefly to resurge during <laughs> the 1990s uh, before the idea of um, uh, 
what's the term where you um, the therapists are creating the uh, oh implanted memories implanted memory false memory false syndrome. false memory syndrome yeah yeah which replaced that as an explanation for why you shouldn't listen to people's uh, reports of sexual abuse so thank you so much for your time it's today it's a pleasure Tom. to be here and uh, you know we're going to go on in another interview about the idea of the importance of evolution in psychology in particular your idea of the importance of parasites both in promoting evolution and in the promotion of uh, thinking in human beings absolutely you know not many people are aware that our behavior is dramatically affected by parasites both biological parasites and what I call psychological parasites an intriguing idea. Tune in next time to see uh, what he has to say about that topic.